Um, if you know, we can just, I guess, if you, if the rest of the board members don't mind, maybe we just chat really quick with, uh, and see what, make sure we know where we're at. If, if my recollection is that we were, you were going to get D, the DEC permitting all in place, and once that was in place, we were just going to follow their permitting. Yes, and we did receive the DEC permit, <clears throat> and I forwarded that to, um, I believe, you and definitely to Max. To Max, yeah, and I saw. It and um, yeah, and the Army Corps permit was also issued as a draft, and um, the only thing waiting to finalize that was um, the applicant Carrie Choi sent in the ten dollar application fee, which she did send in, and then um, they're just processing that, and then that should be official as well. Okay, um, the question arose in the past several days about the uh when, when max and i went down to take a look and the water there was that water that was draining and we requested that you since you were bringing in fill and doing some excavating back there anyway that you put some gravel uh in in the hole a deeper part of the hole and create a dry well to catch all that water and i believe that uh you have dug the hole you put in some gravel and i was going to make an attempt to come down and take a look at it today and got hung up at an inspection for a couple hours who didn't make it so sorry but um okay. i uh spoke with carrie and i'm gonna go down there tomorrow and i know max is gonna make an attempt to go and look also and just for the rest of you guys on the board know if if, if it's okay with you as far as we were concerned i think we all agreed that the the project itself was fine and we just wanted to address this one drainage issue max and i i mean i'm good with that bob Jan? Good here. All right. Uh, so do we need to vote? We don't need to vote on that one. We need to basically maybe, well, if they have got all their permitting in place, if we can get a quorum, we can vote and they can move forward, correct? And we could just have a uh, contingent that Max goes down and takes a look at the hole and I go look tomorrow and everything looks fine? Yes. Okay. Hey, hey Mark? Yes. Don't you have a quorum now? Yeah. Who do we have? You got Bob, you got Andy, you got Jan, and yourself. Four. We do. Wait, four? Or I thought we had. I thought we needed five. You have to have four. You have to have four people. Perfect. Then let us. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 There we go. Permit follows. We have to let Max know because I think he's still struggling trying to get Lou on. All right, I'm here. I'm All right, here. So I, I heard I heard everything, and I'll get that drafted. Um, okay. And it'll probably be sent out early next week. Okay, perfect. Sorry again for the delay. All right, Chris. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so the next one, uh, do we have Riverview Industries? That's me, Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Uh, I can either show you a picture or, or not, but I can I can tell you we've made very we've made very little but some positive progress. Max can assure you of this. You had your site visit. Um, Jan was there and Max was there. Um, there's a ditch along the north side, the Fishkill side of the property. That, uh, that we didn't think was really wetlands and we inspected that with Max and we said, you know, if we could e either bury that ditch or put it in a pipe, because it's not getting much drainage, um, then we would be able to pull the proposed parking lot forward, make it a little wider and get further out of that wetland area, which has clearly been violated in the back. Toward that end, we also had the south the wetlands along the south line flagged and we've mapped that now. I mean, so obviously we still need the wetlands permit, but we think we can improve the situation by widening it out so it takes more of the frontage along Route 9, but it doesn't have to go as deep. That's really all I have to say about that now, and Max might want to Yes. Yeah. Please, yeah, I um so the ditch that Glenn's referring to, I think we were we were discussing Mark and I potentially um you know 
either piping or filling that that drainage it's, it's essentially someone had gone in there with a backhoe and just you know created a drainage ditch on the north end of the uh, actual wetland portion of uh, that's that falls on the property um, the wetland area so I, I don't see any loss by filling that and allowing them to move the, the parking lot the proposed parking lot location further away from the actual resource itself um, I think what I I proposed to Glenn was that that we would need a discussion potentially between the board uh, you know, to not only use this as an opportunity to move the parking lot away from uh, the regulated resource, but also uh, to allow for an additional area that could be restored potentially um, as mitigation to uh, the violation. Okay. And that's, I think, I think that's where the discussion with, with the board is gonna need to come into play is, you know, taking a look at the site plan itself, uh, what they're proposing now after moving the, the lot farther north um, and its intended use and then also the restoration portion of the project. Right, that still is in play, the restoration portion of the back section, right, Glenn? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, I apologize, I don't have that map in front of me. Are we, we're still encroaching on the buffer, right? Even with the new plan? Yeah, um, oh, certainly in the buffer, no question about it. Now we're going to have a new buffer that's coming from the south. Right, right. Um, where's my share? Um, were, we, were we given updated plans yet, or is that something that the planning board is going to then refer back to us? No, I don't, I don't think the planning board wants to see us until we get get you satisfied so I didn't make any I to be perfectly frank our production is a bit, a bit of a problem you know so we will have something for the next meeting it's just we we've just been working you know I'm, I'm sitting in a little tiny room in my house you know yeah, so, yeah no, it's understandable no, I just wanted to make sure that we weren't missing anything so that you know, you're, oh, you're, not, you're, not, you're, you're not missing anything. We did, as I said, we did follow up and we did have uh, uh, Steve um, Marino back out there and flag those additional wetlands out to that culvert that goes underneath the front of the property. Okay. Um, I don't know, just, this is sort of just directed at all the board members as a thought. We, and of course to you, Glenn, as a, in terms of the design, but so we're allowing trucks and oil and everything else to be parked close to the uh, wetland we're doing you're moving as far away as you can can we address in any way the surface runoff such so that it is like I know we did it at years ago at Cold Spring Glass because he put in a parking lot and the, the water the runoff was coming down the driveway and there's that wetlands immediately to the south and there was something put into the the culvert I believe I mean not the culvert the uh, the basin that's so base, I, I don't know that there's a basin solution, but we'll take, uh, we certainly will take a look at it. I mean, right. we'll certainly take a look at it. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank so, you. Any other questions? Anybody else? All right. I guess we are moving on to the next one. Uh, and that would be Scott Johnson, Mountain Brook Drive. Scott, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry about that. No problem. So, I, I, I think we all just need to recap that one a little bit. It was, if I remember right, the purpose of the road was just to get back to a site where a curtain drain was going to be built so that we, you could see if it was, if you could get the septic, if you could get a septic back there at all, if you could get a, a, a curtain drain in, and you could drain it sufficiently and then test retest we're trying to we're still trying to get that septic back near the lake is that do i remember right yes that's correct okay where did we all fall do you remember guys what are well maybe maybe jan i don't know if jan do you, do you want to update kind of the discussion you had with with uh scott 
Um, yeah. But in terms of in terms of the permitting, uh, we were hoping to have a larger attendance at the site visit to kind of get, get our heads around, you know, the difficult lo location of the uh, building area. Um, but beyond that, we were really, you know, they're, they're looking for permission to, you know, for an access to cross an intermittent stream and then also install this curtain drain, which is not within any sort of regulated buffer, but would potentially provide some sort of uh, insight as to whether or not they could proceed with applying for a uh, septic permit or um, potentially having to apply for a uh, effluent discharge permit through the DEC if the curtain drain proves to fa fail at draining the land area there. So that's that's the, the permit itself is to get, gain access uh, to that location to perform that task. And it does cross into a wetland buffer of the stream and then also uh, across an ephemeral stream on the property. Yeah, on the site visit, um, there's an existing road on the adjacent property, which is owned by, now owned by uh, Scenic Hudson. And Scott and I had speculated about whether Scenic Hudson might be willing to grant him access to use part of that road which would make things much easier for him uh, and be much more protective of, of the, uh, the general environment. I think, Scott, you had a preliminary uh, discussion with someone there and they said no, they couldn't grant access. But when I talked to Michelle Smith, she said it sounded like something that they ought to be interested in if they thought about it and understood the potential benefit that would come from it. So uh, I don't know if you had an opportunity to follow up with her or she had any further thoughts about uh, that as a possibility or mm -hmm. not. I have not, but I would love to talk to her about that. That sounds very encouraging. Yeah, I, I just think you should, you know, I mean, we can consider the gravel road, which obviously is a lot of time and expense and difficulty for the conservation board, probably not insurmountable, uh, but obviously it's better for everyone, uh, starting with the you, the environment, scenic Hudson, if there's a way to convince them to grant you some sort of partial access, because then all of these issues that Max described or sort of eliminated. Including the stream crossing, if I remember correctly? I th yes, I think so. Yeah. Sure seems like that's so, the way to go. Max, is that something so I have a, you can help with in, in terms of discussing with Scott and Michelle? Yeah, yeah, I have no problem with that. Um, I think that if it just puts us in a in a place of I guess of trying to figure out what the next steps are. Um, if if Scott is okay with, you know, pursuing that that uh, approach, then we really don't have any. You know, we're not considering I guess what they've submitted in the application process at this point um, at this meeting because I think what they're looking for is approval on that road um, with that ephemeral stream crossing, but if they're open to have to, you know, delaying a little bit longer um, to have that discussion, then I, and I think it would be beneficial for everybody and would show, you know, good faith and, uh, a, you know, a really good attempt at doing the uh, ecologically correct thing and also uh, logistically correct thing, hopefully, um, you know, it might, it might be beneficial for the board in the future. Especially with the, the septic area kind of being a, an X factor or gray area as to how that would be out the outcome of that uh, installing the curtain drain. Right. I mean, for, for one thing from Scott, from Scott's viewpoint, I assume, but don't know, you never really said this. It's sort of highly undesirable for you to go to the time and expense and trouble of building the gravel road simply to get access to put in the curtain drain 
when if the curtain drain doesn't work, you've sort of gone to a lot of trouble that uh, that might or might not be productive. Whereas if you can somehow get an easement to use scenic Hudson's Road in return for, you know, I don't know, putting in a better gate for them or doing something like that, um, it sure seems like a win-win for everybody. Yeah, that, that's exactly right, Jan. And it also, if we if we do put in a temporary, even an access road without the access over the scenic Hudson property, and the for whatever reason we cannot get the curtain drain to work, we've created a real kind of intrusion into the natural landscape that will be there, um, and it just makes sense to use existing roadways if they're there for access. Well, I guess if we can be as a board helpful in any way in speaking with Michelle or helping get that conversation or get that conversation to continue. Uh, I guess let us know. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, I have a I have a question about I see that the uh, comments can you hear me? Yes. So I hear that I mean I see that the you know the septic is outside of the buffer but it does say that basically the discharge pipe is within the 100 foot wet, wetland buffer. So I don't know why we would even entertain that um in a sensitive property like this and why would we even want to have a curtain drain put into an area like this um just to see if you know they could put something in that's going to still require a violation or you know kind of an exception because the, it's going to discharge into the the wetland so I, I guess i'm not seeing what what the benefit is other than obviously you're not putting a road in to do all that test work but I'm not seeing the benefit of even doing the test work. Yeah, I mean, in the discussion at the last meeting, what was that about a year and a half ago? Mm -hmm. um, we, we, uh, the concept was that it's all subsurface water that's moving along towards the lake. And by doing the dry well, or curtain drain, excuse me, it's, it's quite deep, I correct? It was like a seven or eight foot deep? Seven feet, yes. Seven feet. So, it's intercepting all the under the subsurface water and it's redirecting it to the outlet pipe. So obviously there's going to be high hydrologic uh, change to the, to the area beyond that curtain drain. It's going to dry it out to some extent. Uh, but that's the purpose you need to dry it out so that you can put the septic in there. So I think that's the crux of the question is, is, is what is the impact of putting a septic in that area? We have to think forward to if this, if it gets to the point where you're putting a septic in there, how big is the impact? And is there anything that you can do to mitigate the impact? Can you take the, the, the water from the outlet? Is it running directly into the lake? Is it, is it still clean? Are you isolating septic from the lake? How close is the septic to the lake? Those are all the questions that are popping into my head. I mean, so Bob, I, I'm agreeing with you just to a large extent. I think that the idea that, that it's just clean water that's being intercepted is really a, a good thing and it doesn't seem to make much difference but they're all these sort of domino effect right so i guess to be discussed i'm sure michelle will have something to say about that yes also along the lines that you did receive for the last meeting there is the location of the septic system on Beatty watson's drawings and the other thing that we have looked at in the event that this does not work is an application to the dec for an on-site wastewater treatment plant which would be much less intrusive into the environment. We would have to not really cut down any trees to do that. Um, so that's that's a, a, a step two. Okay. Yeah. You know, can I just add? Just I, I, you sort of said it, Mark, but I, I think it it sort of went by a little bit. The um, <clears throat> the curtain drain is prevents flow through the septic system area, and it makes it possible. That's for sure. But there's always water flowing through a septic area. And if you have a curtain drain that's capturing the flow of that water and carrying it around, it's, going to, it, it's obviously necessary for the septic system, but it also, it's not, the water is then not going through the septic area if it were marginal. So it really makes it a cleaner situation. And it is a, and I have to say this, probably not too politic, but he's not asking for an exception. He would be asking for a permit. Very strong 
sales point for the wetlands law many years ago. Got it. All right. Well, uh, I guess if there are no other questions, I, we should just, Chris, please keep us posted on your conversation with Michelle. And I guess, Jan, are you, are you kind of the intermediary, intermediary there with that discussion? Well, I, no, not really. It's just when we were talking on the site visit and Scott was explaining it, it just seemed to me so, so obvious that this was a win-win for everyone that I assumed um, there had to be a way to get Scenic Hudson um, right. on board with it for whatever reason when Scott initially contacted them they were not immediately receptive. On the other hand, I'm sure whoever he was talking to had no idea what all the implications of saying no would be. And I think that's why getting Michelle involved would be helpful. And I spoke to her briefly afterwards uh, when she got back from her vacation and went into lockdown. Yeah. And, uh, she said she was very obviously very familiar with the property, thought this was a great idea, couldn't imagine that something couldn't be worked out uh, with, with Scenic Hudson. Um, and I basically said she'd be, she would, I mean, right. I can't do anything as an intermediary compared to what she can, someone like Michelle could do with Scenic Hudson. So my suggestion to Scott would be to rely on Michelle's good offices. She did say that something like a conservation easement would be, she thought, very attractive to them, that uh, she didn't know if you were interested or willing to do that, but that would be something to think about that in her experience they might well ask for. So Scott, I guess that's the next step. You're, you'll just try to reach directly out to her and keep us in the loop and we'll be as helpful as we can. Yeah, thank you. I will reach out to her tomorrow and keep you posted. And maybe keep, Scott, keep Max in that loop too, if you will, please. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I think, I think also just, just to add one more point to this is that if, if this you know goes through, this agreement goes through with Scenic Hudson and you know potentially some of Scott's land in return gets put into conserva conservation um, under a conservation easement or under protection um, through an easement uh, to allow for access. I think that the idea was that, you know, that would be a step towards mitigation if a system on that on the property would, would need to be put on the property that wasn't a standard septic system outside of the wetland buffer. Um, obviously, I think the best case scenario um, in terms of our permitting process would be that he can put in a conventional system. Um, but in the case that a more on-site treatment facility needs to be installed because the curtain drain has failed, essentially, um, I think the idea was is that, you know, we would take into consideration during our permitting that, you know, he potentially has put portions of his property into, you know, uh, protection in perpetuity, whatever those, whatever those uh, terms may be in the future. Um, so I think there's a lot of moving parts here. I think there, I think Jan's idea potentially um, can work, uh, but it needs to be coordinated. And I think that everyone needs to be on the same page, like, like they were saying. So um, very good. I guess that's all. Yeah. All right. Well, then, thank you, Scott, and good luck. Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's, can we do the Garrison Fishing Game Club? That would be Mark. Sure. You want me to put on video or just in the, here? Uh, the voice is fine. Okay. So I have to say I will, will, um, you know, take part in the conversation here, but if we get to the point where we vote on this, I should recuse myself because I am a member of the club and a fisherman. But uh, that said, is uh, can you just bring us back up to speed? I know we're, we were talking about the, uh, 
chemicals in the pond to kill the the whatever you call it water shield yeah that annoying stuff that makes me not be able to fish right. i don't have i think andy is probably uh the most well versed in this he is being a chemist uh andy what are your thoughts on it um i you know i'm familiar with a particular herbicide um, while it is a volatile herbicide, which we try to stay away from, when you're using it in water, perhaps a volatile herbicide is beneficial because what does not kill a plant is going into the atmosphere. Um, you know, I, I know the pond or lake, whatever you want to call it. Um, I don't look at pond shield as being invasive, but there's obviously too much for what um, the members want. So, you know, in reading the materials that were put together, you know, yeah, there are basically three choices. One is continual cutting it, carp, which I'm not a fan of, and the third is herbicide. So I'm, I'm not uncomfortable with it. Uh, it would sort of be nice um, cost allowing if some form of limology report would be done so that in the long term, you're not continuously um, herbiciding the pond that, you know, what is the cause of this? Is it just a bloom that happened, which is very possible, or there are some houses nearby is something, you know, leaching into the lake that would cause more growth. I haven't really studied the uh, lake that carefully to look at what other plant life is in there. Mm -hmm. Nobody answered those questions. Yes, please. Okay. So I did a site visit in the July of 2019, <clears throat> as you know, the Garrison Club is completely buffered. There is you know, no lawns and places leading up to it. Water Shield only enters a water body through um, seeds that are either brought in through waterfowl or from streams. Um, the Garrison Club tried, you know, looking at many different alternatives. And as they looked into the more alternatives, the water shield spread and spread. So, and all the other alternatives were either too expensive or you know, not economical and um, were told that they actually wouldn't work. Um, you can't hydro rake a, what, you can't hydro rake water shield. Um, the uh, cost of uh, aqua, aqua dredging is totally uh, cost non-effective. They were giving like a price of 150 or $200,000. So, you know, they undertook this with a idea of certainly not continuous. Um, I've been successful in treating water shield after a two year period of then just stopping. So, and working with DEC, because this is a, as you all know, a regulated class one wetland, which is the uh, most um, restricted wetlands to work in, especially with DEC is concerned. We've you know, jumped through a lot of different hoops with DEC and have backed away and backed away and backed away with our treatment area. It's still about, um, I think we're at about under two acres at the moment for actual treatment. So all we're actually doing is trying to open up an area for fishing from the shoreline and enough area to get the boat out from the um, bolt launching areas and leaving almost everything else intact. So we're really not trying to wipe a lot of it out at all. We're just trying to open up areas so that the club can actually utilize the lake for what its purpose was for. As you know, Water Shield, um, if left unchecked, will just take over an entire lake period. You know, and you won't have any open water left at all. And we're not looking for a continuous herbicide use we're looking for a two-year permit from DEC to get everything under control and then let it be for a while and see what happens after that. So we're certainly not looking for, you know, year after year after year treatments at all. Understood. Any other comments? I understand that they don't issue, they don't issue uh, Article 15 permits for multiple years. Um, and I guess the Phillipstown uh, permitting process would only would also be on an annual basis as well, just to keep you in the loop on that. 
it's actually they it, well, this is not just an article 15 it's an article 15 and an article 24. an article 24 is issued for multiple years an article 15 is issued only once a year right you'd have to file an, a, a per, you'd have to file a pesticide permit annually well i would actually ask that if you would approve this you would approve it on the same basis as an article 24 permit yeah, we, we, we do annual permits. So you would just have to renew. If this did get approved, just it would need to get renewed um, once the once the issue, a year from the issue date. They don't have to come back in to us to discuss it at a meeting. They just have to pay the fee and renew it, correct? Right. Yeah, that's, that's not a problem. <laughs> Okay. Um, I guess the other the other point that we made at the meeting uh, last month was that just to reiterate what Andy said was to look at this the application to treat um, the target organism. Uh, basically, we wanted to see and evaluate um, the it, you know the reason for conducting the treatment uh, in both an ecological and recreational capacity. Um, and I guess. I guess we were looking for information to, to expound on that essentially. I think I've provided enough information on why we need to do the treatment. So it's essentially a, for re a recreational purpose. It's not, not to, I mean, the idea is that you have a water body owned by the Garrison Fish and Game Club that at the moment is basically unusable. They are covered in water shield. The water shield needs to be controlled so it can be utilized. DEC agrees with that as well. And all we're trying to do, again, we're not trying to wipe out the entire lake for a water shield. We are just trying to open up specific areas for them to utilize it. I don't think that's, I, I think that's a reasonable request. So, yeah, I have I, a question, I, Mark. So, oh, go ahead. Thanks. Oh, no. I'm, go ahead, Bob. It's fine. So, I, I guess I, I just have more of a question about, you know, the source. I know you mentioned that it comes in from two sources, either the feed stream or the, you know, birds and migrants and things like that. Have you done any kind of surveys in the general area to see if, like, there's a really known source from, like, the Phillips Brook area? I was just looking on the map as just to try to see if there's, like, maybe another source that you know is just going to keep feeding into it i was just wondering if that's uh something you looked into and in every single lake and water body in the in the united states of america you can have one year of a lake filled with water shield and another year of a lake filled with water mill foil and another year with lake full of duckweed just because you have water shield you know upstream from it doesn't mean that it's going to move Sometimes it does, sometimes it will. I have, you know, I'm actually in the process of obtaining a permit for a um, water body, you know, not, not a couple of miles in a different county, not too far away from you. Also has water shield. Um, Sullivan County has water shield. It just happens to be a plant that grows in certain water bodies. There is no rhyme nor reason of exactly why. Um, where actually, again, where if it came from, upstream from that specific it came upstream from the Garris Fish and Game Club. I don't exactly know the answer to that, but I don't know of too many of the water bodies in your area that have water shield. Most of them are just your basic um, curly pond weed and milfoil and things like that. Water shield is not prevalent. It's only, I mean, I think I treat you know, out of 300 treatments a year, you know, maybe four or five water bodies that have water shield. So it really isn't a, you know, huge common vegetation I see continuously. But once you do get it, it's in the water body forever. And unless it's managed, it's just going to take over the water body period. Um, all right. Well, like I said, guys, I'm not sure. Uh, how involved I'm supposed to be in this if I feel I should recuse myself, but it does feel like this is a tip, pretty typical one where we just follow DEC and they're the scientists and have more qualifications than us. And if they feel it's 
an acceptable procedure and they're doing it according to DEC, then I personally, I don't, wouldn't see an issue with it. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I had looked at the literature on water shield. I mean, it is a native plant. And uh, I was sort of hoping to find some literature of why it grows in certain shallow water bodies and not in others. For instance, at Catfish Pond, we have it, but we have very little of it. Um, but it's from the photographs, it's obviously getting worse and worse. So, uh, you know, I don't love using herbicides, but there are times it is the best choice. All right. Uh, anybody else have any other comments? So I think that, I think that no, all I, makes sense. I, I'm sorry, Max. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just ask, you know, if there. Yeah, I'm, I don't mean to beat up on the on the source, but you know, obviously, when there's a source, you just kind of wonder if there's some way that you know, learning from the the you know the episode. So I don't know, maybe if it came in on like bait fish or something like that, maybe that was a possible source, but maybe just explaining that to the members that maybe that's a, a risk item, you know, because other pesticides and uh, not pesticides, other pests can come in for, for fish that way as well. So you know, maybe just that kind of conversation would be helpful to have with the members as well. So just one quick question too. Um, where are you in the process with DEC right now? With in terms of the Article 24 review and the AQV, um, well, keep in mind they go hand in hand. Um, I had a meeting, kind of like Zoom with um, DEC, about two weeks ago, and like I said, we were um, DEC has a guidance that they have to follow the Article 24 permit that that fit within the guidance, and because it's in a Class One wetland, that guidance is a little more stringent than any other. Um, uh, freshwater wetland class. So, you know, we kept on having to scale back in order for the um, biologist to be able to fit into the guidance, the approval to use a herbicide to treat the, to treat the water shield. And we, again, did come up with what we felt was a reasonable solution to that guidance. So I basically had a meeting with the people who uh, work with me for the Article 24, along with the Article 15, pesticide people as well. And, you know, we're looking at the hopefulness of a completed application within the next week or two, and then it goes to public um, notification. And then after that, a permit would be issued. And you would, of course, receive a copy of it as well. So what was there? I'm not familiar with a class, class A wetland it's not, um, and what that means is essentially. Uh, what, why, what were their biologists' concerns about your original plan? Well, the original plan was to treat um, about seven acres, and they weren't happy with removing so much of the water shield, which I understand. So, you know, we came to a couple conclusions. They actually also wanted, you know, just like you, some other information on why they haven't, you know, chose other types of remediation until, you know, they learned that the costs and you know, when they, you know, when they talked about dredging and hydro raking, I don't think they really understood what it meant to bring in the type of heavy equipment and that it wouldn't even reach out to where it needed to, you know, do the work. So once we explained all of that information to them, they were then able to, you know, make a better conclusion. We also had to, interestingly enough, the way the Article 24 and Article 15 permit are issued, you know, there's the pesticide department and you have to fulfill the requirements for pesticides along with fulfilling the requirements for the Article 24. So you really are getting two different permits. And you're talking, even though it's still DEC, it's two separate agencies within DEC working together to issue a permit. So first I have to fulfill the Article 24, and then within that I have to fulfill the requirements of the pesticide permit itself. So it just you know, happened to take a long time to you know, go back and forth, change a couple of different things, educate the people in the Article 24 versus the pesticide people. And once we you know, were able to meet and talk and get everything together, everybody felt better about getting everything issued and you know, put into place. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with the, the DEC process. Um, I think that I'm, I'm still, I, I, I like to hear that, you know, you did reduce the treatment area 
into more strategic locations. Um, if you have any of the technical information that you provided them, that would be very helpful to have to provide us, I think, I did. Uh, in terms of what their, their rationale was. Um, I know you provided us, I, I briefly got a chance to look at uh, some of the memos that you sent or were sent back and forth uh, that you sent to our secretary. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, I guess your response is essentially just to some of their questions in terms of alternate, uh, alternate methods of control um did they have any any concerns biologically in terms of what you may be affecting um within the pond or is that i guess the same question to our board is that something we would like to see if there's going to be any unintended effects potentially on other organisms that you know are supported in the lake currently the, the reason for the choice of using clear cast is that it only affects plants that it does not affect animals in any way, shape, or form. Right, I'm talking about other plants potentially that are desirable. The only other plants that are within that water body are a few lilies, which may get a little browned out, but again, we're looking at, you know, hitting the water shield. I was, you know, in Garrison, uh, in the lake, you know, on top of it, there is no, you know, I didn't see any milk oil, I didn't see any curly, I didn't see, any other native plants whatsoever within that water body. So that's within, not you know, around it, just within the water body. And the clear cast is right. in the water, not around the water. Sure. All right. Well, what is our next step, ladies and gentlemen? Um, it, I guess. If I don't vote, we do not have a quorum. Am I not? Am I incorrect there? No, I I think that we have a quorum and a member can abstain or re recuse himself without destroying the quorum. Excellent. So then in that case, can I have a motion to approve this thing following the DEC permitting? Not right. That's not right. That's not right? What did I do wrong? Well, he, he, I'm sure Jan is, is Jan is right with regard to the quorum, but you have need an you typically need an absolute majority of the board, not of the quorum. So when you only have a quorum, you need all yes votes. And if you don't have four votes, you don't have a positive. You don't have a vote. Michael, I would, I would also feel. I think I would feel more comfortable to. Uh, you know, to, to make sure that, that he gets approved through the DEC process too. Um, mm -hmm. Well, sir, I can't And get some of this additional information from them. I mean, we were, I was only able to really look at what you provided to us digitally, you know, today, so. Um, so is that the compromise then? Maybe that, that they go back to the DEC permit? I mean, is there a time window that this has to be completed by? Well, like I said, first, first of all, I, with or without your approval, I'm not saying you would or wouldn't give it, I need DEC approval before I move forward. So that's number one. Right. I, can't, I can't do anything without DEC approval. Like remember, DEC has really the uh, ultimate ruling on all of this. Um, so I, of course, would, you know, wouldn't be treating the pond until I have a permit approved by DEC. Right. I mean, our wetlands laws are built off of the state's wetland co wetland uh, statutes um, as well. So, our ultimately, we we too also have a final say in that matter. So, um, you know, I understand that you would you still need to have DEC approval so that you're not in violation as a pesticide applicator. Um, so, I think I just want to reiterate to the board that I think we should just make sure that we have all that we're able to review all the information. If we have any inform, any inform, any questions in terms of, you know, other adverse effects that those get answered. Yeah. Well, given right. the uncertainty with the quorum and given the fact that uh, we do not need to give you a permit right this minute because you're not going to have a DEC permit for some time, whenever that is, why don't we just shelf this thing? And when you get your DEC permit, we will figure out to do what to do at that time. How long do you think it'll be? Right. Until I just, you know, I should have a DEC issued permit. I'm going to guess probably the end of June, which is the time that I'd like to do the treatment. 
Right. So we have another meeting between now and then, and we can take this up again at that point, hopefully having a quorum. Does that make sense? I think it does. Yep. Yeah, yeah I agree. All right. So I just have a question, uh, Mark, Mark. I just have a question. Is June the right time? Is like there's a window when the application works most effectively? I'm just, I would assume when it's early, but I just wanted yep. to ask that. No, not when it's early. Um, water shield needs to be fully grown and it needs to have popped out into the water body. So in other words, the water shield oh, okay. is called emergence. So the plant needs to have grown and emerged out of the water. And that usually does happen. The mm -hmm. end of the year. So, you know, we're, okay. we're, our plan was for uh, two full or four split treatments over the course of, you know, six to eight weeks. Okay, so there we go. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, shall we move to Manitou Marsh? Sure. Who is? I don't know if anybody's here. Is this the uh, the um, scientific study proposal? Right. I mean, does everybody? I don't think. Sorry, Sorry Mark. So go ahead, man. Please. Um, I was just saying, I don't think the, uh, the uh, scientist um, is on the call, but I wanted to pass along the information that she sent me. Uh, essentially, she's looking for permission to go into uh, Manitou Marsh, which is owned by Phillipstown, um, and take sediment cores with a group of students over the summer. Uh, she, I believe she specializes in kind of like establishing these types of long-term geologic uh, soil records and analyzing um, soil horizons from uh, wetland areas. I may, be, I may be misstating what she actually does, but she, uh, I know she does look back um, in these types of habitats uh, thousands of years essentially to establish uh, climate um, information and also uh, uh, seed bank information from those time periods. So I wanted to bring it up to the board. I don't know if it was something I necessarily had to bring up, um, but she's also looking for access, which I was hoping to get Mike's take on it from the town board's perspective and also give you guys a sense of uh, what she would need to do. It doesn't seem too intrusive. It's all going to be on foot. I had her, you know, send pictures of the equipment she'd be using. Um, and uh, she, I believe she's also going to provide us with a trans, some transect lines that she would be walking with her class um, to take those samples on. So we would have the exact locations of where they would be within the marsh. Um, so mm -hmm. th that's really it. Um, I, I think essentially I'd write her a access permit if the town board agrees and the conservation board agrees that they're, they would be allowed on there. Um, and then we could stipulate whatever we felt necessary yeah i mean anybody have any comments on this one i i think we should push it through as fast as we can this is exactly what we should be doing here. exactly what kind of carbon sequestration we have and let's go okay yeah no it sounds fascinating it sounded like a, yeah. you know how deep they go Max. you know how deep they go to um is what it said. They're just going to push the, the two inch, two inch uh, coring thing down until they can't push it any further. And they, they don't know how far down the peak goes. Could be a couple feet, could be six mm -hmm. feet. Yeah, I guess two inch a, diameter I think core. A, yeah, I don't think that they use any power equipment. I think it's all by hand. Mm -hmm. um, so I think okay. their term of refusal is just like what Mark said. It's just all manpower. Um, I think that there is a, I think refusal in technical terms, is an act, there's an actual rate at which something starts to slow down and travels less than, I think it's like less than a foot in a minute or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think all of what they're doing is all hand coring. Uh, I can confirm that, but maybe I was also thinking that we could stipulate them just providing us a, a report of how things went um, at the end uh, when they finish. Yeah. That, that sounds good. I'd be very curious to hear yeah. the results of the study once once it comes out. We, I certainly hope they would share it with us. 
Yeah, she's worked. She's done work on uh, a few state parks, uh, state park marshes um, in the area, and she's she's a known entity. Um, she's been doing this for a really long time. Uh, so, I think she's I think she's working with the climate smart folks as well. Okay, so there's some transects that she put in there. So you can see that I may have to contact her again about the north side of the road. Um, that is not our property. So I need to just confirm with her that she can shift that transect one line to the south below the road there mm -hmm. for it to maintain, remain completely on the property. No, I can, I'm, I know it's none of my business and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I know that either it was either Roger or Carl when they were trying to figure out how to fix the road across the marsh, they never hit bottom. Really? Yeah. Really. Yeah. They went down. They were they were pushing stuff down there and down there, and they never hit the bottom. Hit bottom. He might he might be a good. So I'm not sure. I don't remember whether it was Roger or, or or Carl. They both worked on it, but you might get some information out of them. Wow. Okay. I can I can get there. His, his contact info. All right. Well, do you, so. You've got that one in hand right max you know anything from us yeah yeah no i just wanted to i the only other thing is i just want i guess official permission for them to access phillips town property if that's if we right. can have that on record yep um okay thank you guys so let's see the next thing is uh i guess stormwater max anything we have to talk about uh, the stormwater uh, annual report was uh, drafted and reviewed by Mike and Carl, uh, and it should be put, be put on the uh, town website at this time, um, or it should be available mm -hmm. for review. Um, and I think, I believe, Mike, you, if you want to jump in here, um, you were mentioning that uh, there's the potential for voting on its final, the acceptance of the final copy. Um, at the next public meeting that the town board is going to be holding where people can actually come in and comment. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, if you're yeah we had, we yeah. obviously normally have the uh, public hearing prior to the uh, our final approval, but we uh, are allowed in this case to delay the public hearing. We actually put the document online. So therefore, and obviously the presses, the both press groups were made aware of it for any possible comment. Um, what we'll do is we'll we, the board did approve it in the, in the May meeting. We will go ahead and, and and send the report out. And in what'll happen is in the subsequent report, which obviously is the time frame we've already begin beginning now for 2020, we can make any comments uh, once we get back live. We will have a public hearing, and we will incorporate any comments that may be uh, generated at that time into that report. Okay. Um, well, I think we have some minutes maybe from February. Has anybody had a chance to look at those? Um, I had no problem with them. Yeah, I was absent that day, I guess. Right. As was I was also absent. All right, why don't we, I don't know that there's any great rush to deal with that right now since we don't have a quorum anyway, so let's just move on past that. Uh, I think we actually, did we actually just succeed in our first Zoom Conservation Board meeting? Um, did we have, we have Cloud Bank, don't we, with Beth? Did I miss one? Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Cloud Bank. Yeah. Cloud Bank. My apologies, I just skipped right over that. I'm so sorry, Cloud Bank. Come on in. Uh -uh. Thank you. Hi, right, so sorry. That's all right. I just, uh, <laughs> some boards like to skip around. I just wasn't going to let you go home yet. <laughs> you are, are home, so. Um, I don't know, do you want a, a brief description? What, what would you like? I guess, I mean, we have done, we have permitted dredgings uh, in the past, so we have some idea of what's going to be entailed, but sure, please let us know what you're planning. Sure. This is, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the um, 
estate at the top of Cloud Bank Road. Um, it's the Cold Estate Dam, it's a Class B dam. Um, it also happens to be a Class B water body, uh, Cloud Bank Pond, and it's a Class B stream that flows into uh, the pond and then over the dam and back to the Hudson. And um, the Roses bought the property about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago. And at that time, uh, they had an engineer assess the dam and the engineer's report uh, was that the dam was sound, but that they recommended that the sediment accumulating behind the dam be dredged uh, for the safety of the dam, really. And uh, they've had the inspections done since that time. And every year, the engineer's report says you should dredge the sediment behind the dam for the safety of the dam. Um, and this year, uh, the uh, Roses decided that it really was time to do that. They do swim in the pond, they boat in the pond with their grandchildren, and uh, they decided that if they were going to dredge behind the dam, they would like to uh, dredge the, the rest of the pond to the approximate depth that it probably was when it was created back in the early 1900s. Uh, we have worked to find a uh, contractor that can do that uh, hydraulically, both with a cutter head and also, thank you, both with a cutter head and also with a driver, a diver um, assisted uh, head to really uh, finesse the, the sediment removal to make sure that uh, the pond. Uh, edges remain vegetated and intact. The entire pond is, it probably has a 235, 240 acre watershed, most of which is federal or state land. So it's really a, a pristine pond. And the idea is they would like to uh, keep it that way, uh, ensure the safety of the dam and um, have, the, have the depth restored. They have a, a location, a meadow area in the center of the property um, where they would like to dewater the sediment and once it's dewatered, uh, spread it. They, our estimate is it probably six to eight inches of additional uh, sediment spread over the meadow area. And the meadow, interestingly, is primarily organic soils that um, my, my suspicion is they came out of the pond when the pond was originally dug back in the 1900s because um, it's three to four feet of pure black organic uh, sediment. And it's uh, as, as deep as my auger could go, I was still getting organic matter. So uh, we're talking about taking highly organic sediment out of the pond, putting it in the meadow and reseeding it with a uh, wet meadow seed mix to ensure that we get a good cover uh, it's outside of the regulated area from the pond, um, but it's, it's uh, questionable whether uh, a soil scientist would, a soil scientist would certainly call it a wet meadow. Uh, the vegetation doesn't really show that. It's, it's a combination of, of uh, grasses and sedges. So um, happy to answer any questions. We have an a application to DEC and Army Corps. Uh, and I've provided copies of those documents uh, for you. It's uh, unfortunate that the applications went in and the pandemic hit pretty much simultaneously. So we haven't gotten much action from those agencies, but hopefully we will be hearing from them soon. Got it. Um, I just, I'm just curious, this is strictly out of curiosity. What, what is exactly, how does this work? Is this a, uh, essentially a, an underwater vacuum and you're. Yes, it's a, that's exactly what it is. And it has a, a cutter head on the, on the end of the vacuum pose, which sort of, uh, and stirs it up, up the sediment. Yeah. Uh, they put a turbidity curtain around the work area, uh, on any given day so that they're not, uh, making the entire pond turbid when they're working. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got enough of a, a mechanical vibration associated with it that in their experience they find that fish and turtles and anything else, newts that are living in the pond, tend to uh, go away from it uh, and not be anywhere near it. Mm -hmm. uh, and am I, I, if I'm reading, I just want to make sure I understand the plan. The area that's being dredged is the 
is the area right there at the base of the dam, that, that hashed, cross-hashed area? Um, no, it's, the, it's the entire pond. Okay, so uh, what cross is the area? Yeah, that. What is that? That actually is a conservation, a special conservation area that's along the shoreline. Uh, that's not part of the pond itself. Okay. The pond is, is um, shaped almost like a butterfly. In fact, I, I guess some old documents call it butterfly pond. Cool. All right. Yeah. So virtually, yeah. except for a small beach area that they use for access for swimming and they have a, a small dock, uh, mm -hmm. virtually the entire pond is wooded around the edge. Right. There's a perennial stream and two intermittent streams that feed it and lots of springs that feed it. So they extract the, uh, the sediment, it gets piped through a pipe continuously through the machine and then just dumped out the other end right on the it, spot where you're... It gets dumped out into geotextile bags, dewatering bags mm -hmm. that are placed over plastic and at the edge of the plastic are hay bales to make mm -hmm. a little berm. The water's collected and pumped back to the pond okay. clean. Sounds awesome. It is. It's very. I heard one of the other applicants. It's a very expensive process, but um, I think it's the only way that this pond can be uh, successfully dredged without doing un unacceptable harm to the edges. Right. Understood. Well, questions, anyone? I have a few comments. Um, I, I'm not against it. Um, Seven hundred thousand cubic. 7,000 cubic yards of sediment dewatered at 2,500 to 3,000 cubic yards, I just want everybody to realize, is a vast amount of material. It's a huge amount of material. And the, good, the good side is that it is being used on site. Um, the two other comments I'm going to make within the report is, you're talking about controlling invasive plants. Phragmites is invasive. I'm not going to necessarily call cattails invasive. Uh, with, let me just finish. With that said, you're also talking about, not, this is probably not your work, that a structure over the spillway is going to be removed or remediated. No, not, it, not as part of this project. Report from the engineers, Taconic Engineering. So no. I'm bringing this up because I think the permit has more going on than what you're covering. And I think all should be done at once. I don't think anything... When I say not a big deal, the, the uh, dredging is a big deal, but I think if done right, would be fine. But the other two things should be within the permit. Uh, if I may, the Taconic engineer's suggestion that the spillway be reworked and the uh, dam be rebuilt uh, was rejected by the Roses. That is not part of, I, I included the te tectonic report because I wanted you to see the, the consistent recommendation for the sediment removal. Um, the Roses worked with uh, DEC and what they did instead of redoing the dam is they put in a uh, pipe uh, along the side of the dam and they can put a submersible pump into the, into the pond and pump the water level in the pond down by a foot or two feet uh, if a large storm is predicted. And that's what they did um, for the, uh, for Irene and for Sandy. So they can lower the, the level of the water in the pond uh, prior to the storm hitting so that the dam is not stressed. So those, those uh, suggestions for the spillway and the dam reconstruction are not part of this application. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, I think, you know, in normal, under normal circumstances, we would, we would at this point probably schedule a site visit. Um, so we can go and, you know, take a look at the property, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, due to the situation, um, and I guess the other board members, if you want to jump in here too, I was thinking if it would, if it's possible, if you could flag the, um, dewatering area or have somebody flag the corners of that and then uh, allow us to maybe go up to the site individually um, uh, to take a look at the ponded area. I'm curious about the de the, uh, the dewatering area. Did, so uh, you, you went out there and said that you would um, represent it as a wet meadow currently? Well, um, it, it's deep organic soils, but there's no geomorphic reason for those deep organic soils to be there. It's, there's no, 
other than them being placed there historically. So you're, what you're looking at to you doesn't represent a potentially controlled area that you would be filling on top of with the sediment from the lake? I don't think so, but I'd be happy to go out with you and take a look at it and, and uh, okay. that's, I think if, if possible, that's something you, um, and I'd be happy to, to show any of the board members as well. It, I was surprised at how deep those sediments were, or the soils rather. Okay. Um, yeah, that would be, I think, getting on the site and taking a look at those areas. And then um, I guess if you could go into a little bit more about where you're going to be staging the soil during the, 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 during, are you bringing the bags full up to that area and then allowing oh, yeah. them to drain in that location or? The bags are about 150 feet long and 30 feet wide. Uh, so it's a four inch hose that comes from the pump. Uh, it's going to go along the edge of the woods into the bag. It feeds into the top of the bag. The bags are porous. The water comes out of the bag uh, and is collected on the plastic sheeting. And then there's a pump uh, in the on top of the plastic sheeting that then pumps the water back to the lake. Okay. And do you have a location on? Do you point out a location or describe a location on that that plan as to where that's occurring? Yes, that's that's what's going on in the meadow. So the plastic that's, would be okay, put all, right over the meadow. Okay. Okay. Cecilia, could you possibly put that map up again that you just had that had the red square and what looked like maybe the pipe? Yeah. Is that? This that is a, that's the aerial that it shows the the yellow. Um, would be the pipe from the furthest point in the pond mm -hmm. uh, through the woods and the, the yellow square or rectangle uh, yep. would be the, uh, it's about three quarters of an acre for the dewatering area. Mm -hmm. And that area is that's relatively what? flat now so that it's really the only area on the property uh, where that would work. And that's all temporary Absolutely. infrastructure, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Max, and that I, all lays on top of that lays on top of the ground, uh, yes. the piping. Yes. Okay. I agree. I'd just be very curious to go take a look at it, not for just from curiosity's sake. So if you arrange a meeting, let me know, and I'll stay six feet away from you. Take exactly. I'm happy to meet you and stay six feet away. I, I just uh, had a meeting out there last week with Scenic Hudson because they do have a conservation easement on the property, and uh, we were, that's when I took my auger out and. As I say, I have I have taken soil samples closer to the house, which is mineral soil and has has rock. And I I really was very surprised when I was out in the middle and the auger just went right in. So, um, would you mind uh, emailing me, and Max, when you uh, and just to get a chain started, and we can figure out when we can come up and look. Or Max, would you be willing to send that out? Yeah, I can I can coordinate that so everybody can try to get an opportunity to get out there. Um, awesome. Right. Yeah, it, it, I think it, too, if we could, um, if you could just, uh, if, if there is a rough estimation of the corners of that dewatering area, we could just lay those out with like, I can put know, flags small, out. Sure. that'd be perfect. Um, but yeah, I, I think we can do that. That's fine. Um, and uh, you're, you're based in Connecticut. So how much lead time would you need uh, to make an appointment out here? Um, I'm I'm available at your at your convenience. I will make myself available. I do need about an hour and a half to get over there. Okay. So. Um, All right. So we'll if, give you at least a, a day's heads up. That would be great. And um, if it could not be, you know, at six o'clock in the morning, that would be <laughs> fun too. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's see. Uh, did I skip anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Beth. Thank you. Yeah, All I right. guess the uh, the key point, I guess, would just be to get this done before our next, before the deadline of the next meeting, so that we can vote uh, in June. Yeah, Max, let's try to do it. Let's try to do it next week sometime. That'd be great. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. And Max, you'll let you'll let people know in case they can join. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, right. and if anybody has any concerns about distancing or anything like that, and if they would rather go alone, I'll uh, maybe I can do like a follow-up meeting and 
we can do a, an individual visit um, and maybe we can have you on the phone or something like that. Uh, sure, I just need to let the roses know when people are going to be there. That's all. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll make sure. And I don't know if you've ever driven up Cloud Bank Pond, uh, Cloud Bank Road, but it is a very narrow, very steep, very windy road. So please be careful if you go by yourself. Yep. That's welcome to get. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Uh, do Thank we have you. anything else? Thank you. Do we have anything else we're supposed to talk about? If not, um, I have I have two brief updates. I, uh, one is that we're still working with Roberto on updating the NRI. Mark, were you on that call the other day? I don't know if you want to. I, I was. I, was I, I had two calls going at once, so I heard you you on there, but I don't know if you want to give an update. <laughs> Basically, um, all, all I said was uh, I agreed with everything you said. <laughs> no, there was one thing <laughs> interesting. <laughs> there was one thing interesting actually that Roberto brought up, brought up, and that was the, the that that uh, layered access, information access that, 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 is good, that you guys are working on is, or that he is working on, or they are working on, somebody is working on, that will help us with these situations like the one on, on uh, by the burden bottle where the people are ready to build a house and they suddenly find out, well, guess what? You only have a buildable area this big, you know? And it'll yeah, be- Yeah, I am. Uh, yeah, I'm putting together an online tool right now. With, uh, I'm working uh, using a, an Esri like online platform that will be able to put on the town website so that uh, anybody can go in and access, find their parcel, and then you can click through all all these different available um, natural resource layers to uh, infrastructure layers uh, that are mostly publicly available. Um, some that we've pulled from um, sources in the county and uh, from NGOs in the community like Cena Hudson and um, Hudson Highlands Land Trust. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so we're putting that all together now. Um, we have a mock-up version of it. That's a draft that only re basically Roberto and I can look at, but yeah, all the technical stuff I'm trying to, I'm getting done. We have a, Roberto and I have a call on Thursday, just to going to give him an update on where I'm at. But right now I'm basically getting all the, all the information compiled so we can start to manipulate it into a way that can be um, consumed by like an end user who, on the website and then also utilize it to update the natural resource inventory document itself. So, right. um, but it'll be Phillips town specific. So uh, it'll you know be focused on everything within the town and then one mile beyond the town boundary. So. Mm -hmm. um, then that's mostly the beyond the boundaries for reference, essentially, as to kind of where things connect uh, beyond the county borders or town borders. Yep. That's excellent. Yep. Good. Yeah. Uh, but I guess they're going to do that. It looked at, at the end of the meeting, they were eliciting uh, suggestions, responses. How, how long, how often do you want to do this? Do you want to do it ever again? And the uh, consensus seemed to be they're going to do it at least two or three times a year. So we should see another invite. It was, it was interesting to see all the, you know, fellow conservationists, everybody's interested. It was good. Well, um, and maybe for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, this was a call that Hudson Highlands Land Trust pulled together and um, we tried to circulate the invitation around to the board members, but um, I believe it was, you know, uh, the land, some land trust, DC representatives, and then um, other, like Mark was saying, other, uh, advisory board or, or conservation board members from uh, Westchester and uh, eastern parts of Putnam County. Um, so, city of Beacon. It was good. Yeah, Beacon. Yeah. Um, was there something? There was something else that you said, Max? Right? There were two things you wanted to. Oh, we had one one violation in Continental Village. Some a guy was draining, trying to drain a wetland on his property into a. Uh, uh, Sprout Brook. Um, oh. So I sent him. I think I cc'd you, Mark, on the the notice. But he he he's been noticed. Um, and uh, you know, it's you know, it's a pretty simple fix. So my basically my notice to him was instead of bringing him in front of the board and trying to rectify the situation month after month, I said, you know, to install silt fence and basically regrade and, and reestablish the area as it was. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working with Greg on that to enforce that essentially. Um, 
I'm trying a different method than in the past since we've had difficulty, uh, you know, with, with people staying consistent during a time when uh, consistently coming to these meetings to uh, figure out a solution to a problem that we're kind of forcing them into. So um, because they violated a, a, our code. Um, okay. So I'm seeing if we can work through it that way between Greg, him and I, and then it just be, and do the, I, I wouldn't go around you typically, I think, uh, but, I want to see if we can work this out. It's not a huge, huge issue in my opinion. So anything yeah. larger would obviously be brought back in front of you guys. No, I think so. it's not good. It'll, it'll happen. It'll be yeah. fixed quicker. Um, yeah. Just curious. You mentioned that have we heard anything about our buddy. What's his name? Jose on Oxio. Yeah, he was noticed again. Um, and he's been multiple complaints. Complaints have come back against him. Um, he hired a, the engineering firm that was working with him that we were happy with uh, essentially uh, stopped providing him services. Um, so he hired an, an another engineer and the engineer and I spoke uh, a month or so ago and I haven't heard anything back from him. But as far as I'm aware, all, all of his violations still stand on the property and he's and essentially the token we have is that he's not getting his building permit for the remainder of the um, construction he wanted to do on the site right. until it can be rectified. But I, uh, again, it's a, mo it's not only now an issue with us and complying with finishing his, uh, restoration plan on the property. And then also the violation of filling in the area that he was, you know, prohibited from filling in. Um, you know, uh, he's also got violations, just, you know, general code violations with, you know, lighting on his property and right. noise and, so nightmare. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. Are we good? Did we complete it? All right. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good job, Aye. Mr. Chairman. Welcome back. Thank you, Jim, very much. Aye. All right, guys. Stay well. I'm checking out. Have Take a good care. night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.